much for your kind introduction. And, and uh, uh, I can start where Professor Koller stopped, actually. Uh, she said, the normative power of Europe is no longer as relevant as it used to be. Uh, but let me say, uh, there is the realization in the European Union uh, that we need to invest uh, in normative power and in real power. Uh, and uh, the, the first thing I would say is um, when uh, the new commission started, but now it's more than two years ago already, the first thing they said that they want to be a geopolitical commission. So there was finally a realization that for uh, thinking Europe or rethinking Europe, you need to define your own role in the geopolitical surrounding in the external world that you are. Uh, what did they say at Ursula von der Leyen and others? They said, we need a sovereign Europe. And we have in the European Union now this discussion about a sovereign Europe. Uh, and then they said, we have to come from the power of language to the language of power. Uh, the rhetoric was promising, but there was no follow up that I can see in the documents which the European Commission is really preparing. Uh, and uh, I return to this normative power of Europe. Uh, one of those issues where the European Union uh, should have its strength and traditionally has its strength is this normative power, is the, the role of of uh, uh, norm settings, including trade, but also including things like the cyberspace, uh, the, the privacy laws, and so on. This normative power is no longer there. But we still have, and that's, I think, we should not leave out, we, we have the power at, of attraction uh, of the European Union for a lot of neighboring countries to see the least. Neighboring countries up to Georgia. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it is quite relevant that the European Union and its member states are constantly thinking about uh, how to use this. If I would be Vladimir Vladimirovich, I would now say what the European Union is doing is creating zones of influence in Europe. And, and to a certain extent, when you look at it from the point of power relations, it's true. We, as a European Union, uh, are, are creating zones of influence because of our attractiveness to neighboring countries. But in our definition, we say that's obviously their own choice if they want to follow up on these zones of influence. We're not doing it by military means. Uh, um, but when you look at it from the idea of how you structure geopolitics in and around Europe, uh, there is this element of creating zones of influence. You might then, and this is, has been has studied for a long time, you might say uh, the whole enlargement process and the whole process of good of this uh, neighborhood policy uh, is actually a step-by-step -step attempt to make use uh, of this uh, attractiveness of the European Union, uh, but not taking into account what happens on the geopolitical scene. Because looking at what's happened today in the last few days, you might say, we should have as a European Union acted earlier. We should have a, a real give a perspective of European integration. Uh, and I remember a, a lot of, of, of political leaders uh, 20, about 20 years ago, uh, when there was the, the, the first time that in the European Union, there was a real discussion about the Ukraine, accepting the Ukraine maybe as a future member, uh, it was told everybody that we should be very careful. We should not even mention a European perspective when we are in contact with uh, Ukrainians. And there I'm leaving my, my study part as a diplomat. Uh, when I gave lectures in Lviv, uh, my minister told me, you can speak about everything, but not about the European perspective of Ukraine. So maybe in this sort of creating, some, make use of, of, of our also normative power, um, this is a case where it shows that if you don't look up what's happening in the geopolitical surrounding, it's very difficult for you to make the right decisions as a, as a European Union. Uh, and, and so it, it is obvious that um, we are not we are not very far in our attempts to create a sovereign Europe uh, in spite of the so-called geopolitical commission. Uh, and one has to say uh, that uh, these sort of cha fundamental changes 
not incremental, but fundamental changes of, of, of really uh, the language of power uh, seems to be difficult without revolutionary moments. And I don't see in the European Union a revolutionary moment. Professor Koller talked about all those uh, movement towards uh, more integration, which were demanded by crises. But these crises were not moments of fundamental change. Where crisis, although one, if there is now a, a more taxing power for the Commission, possibly that is an important thing. If, it, if there are common debts now in the European Union, that is an important thing. And certainly the banking union and so on. But it's not a paradigm change of the project. Um, uh, so uh, if we really talk about rethinking Europe in geopolitics, uh, we have to take into account what's happening uh, in China, Russia, and the, and the United States. Uh, and uh, for instance, um, I'm not involved in the inner circles of the European External Service, but I could have told them, or many could have told them, that it is very obvious that Mr. Putin will not start uh, his action in the Ukraine before the 21st of February. Uh, February. Why? Because it is the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games uh, in Beijing. And that's what happened on, on the 22nd. The next day he gave his speech on how he sees that the Ukraine is, is not a relevant state or shouldn't be a state, only a state only created by, by the Soviet Union. Laughable. But that's my last point already, that when you look into uh, how to rethink Europe and geopolitics, you have to, to understand what Mr. Putin is saying in this, in this circumstance. He is speaking about memory. He is speaking about the inclusion of memory into political decision making. And memory is something uh, which, is, which can be instrumentalized in many ways, but in the Given geopolitical situation, uh, with all the identity discourses, uh, uh, not only in, 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 in academia, but also in politics, uh, it is obviously that everybody can use memory much more salient, much more obvious, uh, and even much more in the way of lying. Uh, then, then it was the case uh, in a stable in a stable system where you don't have to talk this. So history in the form of me collective memories is back and is being used politically. And there is unfortunately no better example than what happened, what happens uh, right now. Uh, and I'm myself a historian uh, and uh, I, I teach a course on, on politics of memory in Europe at the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna. Uh, and uh, uh, it is, um, when you look at what's happening now, uh, the, uh, we talk about who are the actors in memory battles? Uh, and you can really see that this is the funny thing is that Mr. Putin, from seen from politics of memory, uh, is actually not one of those uh, memory battlers talking about history, but he is someone who is a prospective in this actor centered orientation, saying that I am interested uh, in what can I achieve by using memory uh, and not allowing uh, a, a pluralist attitude to these sort of memory issues. Uh, so what I think what, what the European Union uh, has to learn, uh, how, to, how should we and how can we use the memory that we have in the European Union? Uh, should we also pillarize it or make it plural or make it less plural? Are we investing enough in, in the co a common cultural rational? Uh, or we are mainly defensive. And I, I read so many pessimistic ideas about, uh, about the core of the idea of the European Union that I think that, that tells me that actually we have to invest in this cultural core uh, of the European Union. And that's why I agree again to, to Professor Koller that this discussion about rule of law are very essential issues. Uh, because we see that there are different, even in the core of Europe integration, there are growing different uh, um, uh, perspectives on, on what's possible. And that's true within the EU member countries and for the European uh, Union as a whole. Uh, so he, he, here I stop actually, I think I, I've said already too much by comparing uh, the European Union power zone of influence with the Russian zone of influence uh, on such a day, but I, I, I thought it's important and that's what I was asked to do, to give a few words about how to rethink in, in geopolitics today. Thank you.